on a spotlight on generative AI. And thank you so much, Mitchell, for starting our recording of the presentation. Uh, today, we will be discussing generative AI. Uh, my name is Rosemary, and I am joined here today by my co-host, Mitchell. We are both associate learning experience designers here at LSU Online and Continuing Education. And today, we're here to talk about the hot topic of generative AI. Uh, this workshop is for all attendees with all different types of backgrounds, whether you're very experienced and knowledgeable about AI, or if you're brand new to the topic. Either way, this session is for you. And speaking of you, before we go ahead and get started with our workshop, I'd like to take some time to have some introductions. So if all of you could just really briefly in our chat box here, uh, introduce yourselves with your name and your department. I'd love to see where you all are from before we get going with our presentation today. <laughs> Wonderful, so we have some history, law, education, music, geography, anthropology, biological sciences, education, business, all sorts of different backgrounds. This is wonderful. Computer science. Up I see School of Education, my alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's always wonderful to see such a diverse group. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for introducing yourself. And uh, again, I'm so glad that you all can join us today for this hopefully very educational and enlightening workshop about AI. So without further ado, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. All right. So by the end of today's workshop, it is our hope that you'll be able to define generative AI at a basic level discuss the considerations and limitations of generative AI usage, use generative AI tools to craft learning experiences and facilitate teaching and learning, and also have discussions with students about appropriate generative AI usage when participating in courses. During today's workshop, please feel free to type any questions that you have in the chat box at any time, and either Mitchell or myself will gladly answer. We'll have several points throughout the workshop where we'll stop for brief questions, and we'll also be staying after the workshop concludes to answer any additional questions via microphone or chat if you have any remaining questions at the end. Again, this workshop is designed to introduce the concept of generative AI. We're facilitating discussions about how it can be used effectively by faculty and students, and we aim to help faculty navigate any considerations and limitations regarding AI implementation in our courses. We'll recommend some ways that our team uh, advises to design, revise, and adapt your courses using AI. And again, this is a introductory workshop for all different levels of participants. So let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to begin by asking all of our attendees here today a question. How familiar are you with generative AI? Uh, as we've seen, I know we have a diverse group here today from lots of different backgrounds. So it'd be wonderful to know what level of ex experience you all have with generative AI. You should see a poll appear on your screen very shortly. So please indicate which option best reflects your current level of knowledge with generative AI. You should go ahead and see that poll on your screen now. Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. And great, it looks like all of our participants have answered the poll. So let's go ahead and take a look. 
All right, looks like we have a pretty big uh, variety of people here. We have someone who's never heard of generative AI, brand new topic. We have some who may have heard of it, but never really used it, don't really know what it is. We have uh, some of you who have used generative AI tools a few times, and a few of you use them very frequently. So glad to see such diversity here. And uh, thank you so much for sharing those levels. It helps us a lot to know uh, the level of experience you all are uh, coming into our presentation today with. So thank you. All right, so AI or artificial intelligence is a huge topic of conversation right now, but that is because of a relatively new development called generative AI. Before we delve into generative AI, it is important to know its origins. Many years before generative AI even existed, we had something called discriminative AI, which draws distinctions between different kinds of input. For example, let's say I'm designing a system that I'd like to be able to use to predict whether any given painting that I supply is by Vincent van Gogh. Uh, to do this, I would train the system by showing it lots of famous paintings by all kinds of different artists and telling it which ones are by Van Gogh and which ones are not. Once that system is trained, it would be able to make the distinction on its own, making it a discriminative AI tool. Did you know that you're probably already using discriminative AI tools in your everyday life? The spam filter in our email systems, personal assistants like Alexa or Siri, facial recognition on our phones, and fraud detection systems that your bank might use to detect possible fraudulent transactions. Those are all examples of discriminative AI. Now, on the other hand, generative AI is something relatively new that allows a system to create something that did not previously exist. For example, let's say I want a picture of a space shuttle drawn in the style of Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh. It's something that we know van Gogh definitely never painted, but the AI can imagine based on its training what that might look like and it will be able to produce a similar painting that we can expect based on that input. There are all different types of generative AI tools, including those that can generate text, images, videos, and music. There's a huge variety. And this session today focuses on generative AI. So compared to other forms of AI, like discriminative AI, uh, which focuses on recognizing things and has been studied for decades, generative AI can create its own original content based on minimal directions that are provided by a human. It's trained with a large database of content known as a large language model or an LLM. An LLM is an algorithm that can generate and manipulate content based on human prompts and information from massive data sets. In simple words, the LLM can identify patterns in works from its database and it can produce brand new content through reinforcement learning through human feedback, which is uh, stands for RLHF. That's how the AI behavior is reinforced based on how humans respond to it, uh, such as upvoting or downvoting a response from ChatGPT, a popular generative AI tool. Uh, it's important to emphasize that generative AI generates text, images, audio, video, all of those using algorithms that are pre-trained. That means that the generative AI tools have already been fed all of the data they need to carry out their tasks. They're designed to take one piece of input, such as a prompt written by the user, and transform it into what it predicts is the most useful output for the user. During the training process, generative AI algorithms are fed large amounts of data, such as images or text, and they use that data to learn patterns and make predictions. As the algorithm processes more and more data, it gradually refines its predictions, improving its accuracy and the ability to generate new content. That whole process that I just described is achieved through a complex system based on the data it's processing and the performance of its predictions. That's a really technical explanation, but in short, what it means is that generative AI can indeed learn. 
And it's this ability to learn and improve upon itself that makes it a powerful tool for a wide range of applications, such as image and speech recognition, natural language processing, and creative content generation. So what are some examples of some popular AI tools that we've been uh, seeing used lately? There are many generative AI tools already in existence, and there are hundreds being created each week for all different kinds of purposes. So the list that you see here on this slide is just a very small sample. Also, please note that all the tools we'll be presenting today in the workshop are hyperlinked here in the slides. So you'll be receiving a PDF of this presentation as well as a recording of the session. So then afterwards, you'll be able to click on these links and explore each tool for yourself as you would like, which we highly recommend. So first here we have the star child of the moment, ChatGPT. Uh, that is a conversational AI for interactive text-based conversations. There is an upgraded version of ChatGPT that is available now that also accepts image inputs. But ChatGPT is capable of building off previous messages that you've sent it. Uh, therefore, it's able to have a conversation with the user. For example, you could ask ChatGPT to generate a list of 10 different recipe ideas for a family of four. And then you could follow up that message with a request to adjust the menu based on a certain diet or maybe change some recipes out for ones that you might like better. Um, so it can carry on a conversation in that manner. Next here we have Dolly, which is an image generation program based on text inputs. And uh, in a moment, you're going to see a example, and I think you might have seen the dog on a jet ski on the uh, previous slide that we had there. That image was generated by Dolly, something that did not exist previously. Now we have an impressionist painting of a dog on a jet ski. Perplexity is another one of our favorites since it functions very similarly to ChatGPT, but it's connected to the internet. This means that it has access to real-time information which ChatGPT cannot. Uh, it can talk about recent events and it can learn and adapt from recent developments. Prime Voice allows you to create audio clips of AI generated voices reading a script that you provide to it. Uh, it lets you choose from one of their pre-programmed voices. They have lots of different ones you can choose from, or you can upload recordings of your own voice to make a new voice profile and then that voice profile can read your scripts that you provide to it. So it sounds just like you are the one talking. Uh, similarly, a tool called Synthesia can create videos of AI generated avatars with realistic syncing between the mouth and the words all provided from a script that you type in. And then last on this list, this is one for our computer science folks. We have one called AlphaCode, which is a popular tool used to debug and make suggestions for improving computer code. So as you can see, this is extremely short list, but just a small sample of the vast different uh, purposes that we have for generative AI tools. So now that we have a basic understanding of generative AI, I'd like to go ahead and show you some demos of three different popular generative AI tools. For this portion of the workshop, I've prepared some pre-recorded demos for us to look at from three popular programs. We have ChatGPT here, Perplexity AI, and Dolly. So we'll go ahead and start with ChatGPT here. So as we know, ChatGPT is a text-based tool, meaning I will provide a written prompt and in turn, it's going to provide a written answer. So go ahead and start playing my video here. Let's say that it's my father's birthday coming up and I'm stumped on what to give him as a gift. I'll use the prompt, suggest 10 possible gifts that I could give my father for his 60th birthday. He loves to garden, read, scuba dive, and fly small planes. He also recently bought a small sailboat that he takes to local lakes and to the coast. That's a real description of my dad, by the way. He's a real big adventurer. <laughs> so as we can see here, uh, it's giving us lots of great suggestions for popular gifts. Uh, it's giving us that full list of one through 10. 
And let's say that I'm particularly interested in sailing gifts since he just recently bought the sailboat. I can ask ChatGPT to provide a list of only the sailing theme gifts by following up with another prompt saying, I like the idea of sailing gear. What are the most popular sailing theme gifts that my father might like? So I can go ahead and propose that follow-up question. And we see that it immediately provides another uh, list of only sailing themed gift ideas. Now, this is a really wonderful list of ideas because I'm not a sailing enthusiast myself. I don't know much about sailing, but I know my dad really loves it. So it's really nice to have these suggestions. And I look at these and I think, oh, I really like the ideas of maybe the apparel, like a jacket, gloves, and a watch. So I'll ask one more follow-up question. And I'll end my conversation with ChatGBT by asking it, what are the best brands for sailing jackets, gloves, and a watch? So I'll go ahead and put that last follow-up prompt in there and see what it suggests for me. And here we see that for each category, for the jackets, the gloves, the watch, it lists some popular brands. Uh, it talks about the most well-known features of each of those brands' products. And as you can see, carrying on with ChatGPT like this is like carrying on a normal conversation. It remembers those previous prompts that I've talked about before with it, and it's able to build on those prompts in a logical way. So that is a very short demonstration of what an interaction with ChatGBT looks like. Now I'm going to go ahead and move on to our next demo, which is Perplexity AI. Now Perplexity AI is very similar to ChatGBT. It's also a text-based tool, but remember the big difference between Perplexity and ChatGBT is that this one is connected to the internet. So it's aware of current events, and how it works is it conducts live web searches to fuel its answers to these prompts. So I'll go ahead and start playing my video here. So for this example, I'm gonna pretend that my husband and I are planning a trip to Italy. I'll use the prompt, design a five-day travel itinerary for a young married couple in Italy during springtime. Include recommendations for restaurants every day for lunch and dinner, keeping to a moderate budget. So in a moment, we'll see it ask a follow-up question. And this follow-up question is asking about what cities in particular we might want to visit in Italy. Let's say we don't really know much about the area, so I'm just gonna skip this question for now and see what it recommends for us. We then see the specific web search prompts that it's using. We see a list of all the resources that it found on the web to pull its information from. Uh, it's a list of 39 different articles we see it found. And it's going to go ahead and start writing that five-day itinerary that it's designed for us. Uh, the video here is showing how Perplexity works in real time. So it's pulling data from all of those resources that it found on the web, and it's writing out the full itinerary for us. We can see it working as it goes ahead and types everything out for us. Uh, similar to ChatGPT, Perplexity also accepts follow-up prompts. So after it writes this itinerary, I could very easily ask it to say, uh, hey, instead of going to Venice and then uh, Florence and then Venice, I want to swap those. Or I want to make sure that I see this other landmark that I'm real curious about. Uh, so we could very easily modify this itinerary if we wished. And there we have it. We have a five-day itinerary. It's uh, doing exactly what I wanted, suggesting activities and also suggesting some different uh, meal ideas where we might eat for lunch and dinner on each day. So there is an itinerary written by Perplexity AI. All right. And lastly, we have a demo of Dolly, which is the image producing tool. So let's say that I'm a new LSU employee and I'd like to decorate my office with some original AI artwork of Mike the Tiger. So I'm going to go ahead and use Dolly to see if I can do that. So here I'm going to use the prompt, cute cartoon of tiger face wearing glasses. Okay, and you can get really technical with these descriptions or keep it real simple like that. And I'll wait a moment to see what it creates with that prompt. 
and it's going to show me a few different examples. And these are super cute. I really like this one a lot. Uh, so I can go ahead and click on it to bring it up full screen. Uh, at this point, I could download this artwork to my computer if I wanted by clicking the download button there. Uh, I could also click on the variations button. And what that's going to do is produce new pictures based on that one picture that I really liked, just to see if there's any that I like even more. So I'll wait for that to process. And we'll see a few more pictures that are very similar to that one. And I think I found my favorite. So I can go ahead and click on the one that I really like the most and download it to my computer so I can print it out. And that is a very short demonstration of how Dolly works. So I hope you enjoyed seeing some brief demonstration of how each of those three AI tools work. Now for the next portion of our workshop, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Mitchell who will be leading us in an activity to further highlight the capabilities of these tools. So Mitchell, over to you. Thank you very much, Rosemary. As you saw in the demonstrations, the content that these tools can generate sound like something a person might write or draw. But I'm curious if you think you can spot AI-generated content when it's next to human-made content. We're going to try through a game that we like to call Bot or Not. On the next few slides, you're going to see a prompt in three examples. A poll is going to appear on your screen. And on each slide, we're going to ask you to identify which example you think was generated by AI by selecting the number of the item in the poll. Does anybody have any questions before we begin? If not, let's get started. Okay, so for our first one, you see three reality show ideas below. Take a moment to read the prompts and select the one that you think was generated using AI. We have Fix My Frankenhouse, Culinary Rumble, and Britain's Worst Driver. Okay, we have about 40% of our participants have uh, taken a shot at this. We're over half. Very interesting response uh, responses. All right, just waiting on a few more people. Give you all a few more seconds. All right, and that is just about everybody. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here, and let's share the results. As you can see, we have kind of a mix of responses here. Looks like there's a tie between Culinary Rumble and Britain's Worst Driver. Rosemary, if you'll re reveal the answer, please. So Fix My Frankenhouse is a show on HGTV. Britain's Worst Driver is part of uh, several other reality shows. And Culinary Rumble was the one adapted from ChatGPT. But I don't know. Between you and me, I can imagine this could uh, show up as a reality show anytime on Fox. All right, let's do our next one. So these three historical fiction novels had their synopsises generated by AI, but only one of them is actually referring to a book that doesn't exist. So take a moment to skim over the synopses and select the one you think was generated by an AI tool. Is it number one, the Roman sculptor, number two, the Scottish healer, or number three, the Egyptian scholar? This one requires just a little more skimming, so I will 
give y'all just a, a little extra time to put in your responses. We're just below half. Interesting distrib distribution. I'm looking forward to seeing how the rest of y'all respond. I'll give y'all about 15 more seconds. All right, just waiting on a few and I'll give y'all about five more seconds. All right, let's see those results. So, uh, looks like we have. Most people think Roman sculptor with Egyptian scholar close behind, followed by Scottish healer. So let's see the results here. The Roman sculptor one was adapted from ChatGPT. Uh, the other two were based on real uh, on real novels. All right, and we have one more round of bot or not. This one's going to be a little different from the others because now we have adorable Basset Hounds. Take a moment to look at each of the images and select the one that you think was generated using AI. All right, we got over half. Give y'all just a little more time. We're about 75% of the way there. If you're not positive, go with your gut. I promise this isn't for a grade. I'm waiting on one more. And give you about five more seconds. All right, so looking at our results here, it looks like most people think it's picture number three with followed by picture number one with just one less and then picture number two. So Rosemary, if you don't mind. As you can see, the first two adorable puppies were, pr were brought to us by real Instagram users. The third one was generated by Dal E. However, uh, what's what's interesting about this one is that sometimes you can find little imperfections. Uh, some of those imperfections you might look and realize, oh, that's just a trait of a, of a dog. For example, the, the puppy with two different colored eyes, so picture number one. However, picture number three, when you when you get the uh, when you get the PDF, take time to zoom in on the picture and you'll notice that the fur on its ear is slightly above. Now that's kind of a product of how early some of this stuff is. That might that those kind of little imperfections may uh, may improve over time. So I hope that y'all enjoyed our game of bot or not. And now I'm going. Now that you've seen what generative AI can do, let's talk about how you can design, revise, and adapt your course using these tools. We've come up with a list of ways you can encourage your students to use generative AI and how you can use those tools in your own teaching. You'll also have the opportunity to brainstorm some ideas along with us, and you might just learn a thing or two from a generative AI tool. All yours, Rosemary. Hey, thank you so much, Mitchell. And I'm glad everyone had fun with the bot or not quiz. That's a really uh, fun activity. <laughs> okay. So at this point, we're going to explore the question, how can we use these amazing generative AI tools in our own contexts? Uh, let's take a look at some examples. First, probably the most useful way we can incorporate generative AI into our practice is to use it as a brainstorming tool for our course design. What if our instructors could automatically align all of their instructional materials with learning pedagogies like Bloom's Taxonomy or Universal Design for Learning Principles? Imagine providing all of your course's learning outcomes to a generative AI tool and having them automatically revised so they are specific 
measurable and aligned with your course description and your course outcomes. Generative AI can do just that. It analyzes content that you develop and it can provide recommendations on how to align and improve it. AI can also suggest specific modifications or enhancements to your instructional materials, like incorporating more diverse media formats, providing some additional scaffolding or support for different learning styles for your students, or designing activities that foster higher order thinking skills, which all ultimately enhance the effectiveness and inclusivity of the learning experience for all students. There are also some smaller ways that generative AI can be used in course development, such as generating voiceovers based on written scripts. It can assist with the creation of discussion forum prompts, which encourage our students to actively engage in lively conversations. It can proofread instructional materials for clarity and alignment, and it can assist with the creation of study guides based on provided content that you give it. Also credit where it's due, all the suggestions you see here with asterisk were ideas suggested by our friend ChatGBT. <laughs> now let's take a look at some examples of how exactly we would phrase prompts for generative AI in each of these scenarios. For the first scenario, for the example of using AI to suggest instructional methods to explain specific concepts, let's say we're teaching a computer science course and we're trying to introduce the topic of for loops in coding, but we want a more engaging way to present the content other than just demonstrating for loops in a video. For this purpose, we could use the prompt suggest some engaging and innovative ways that I could introduce the concept of for loops to my students in an online programming course while adhering to best practices in online course design. So that is my prompt that I have designed. And we see that if I give ChatGPT this prompt, it is going to give us a list of suggestions ranging from using a real-time integrated development environment, an IED, IDE with a live code editor to visual programming tools like Scratch or Blockly, or having students connect the concept of for loops to real world scenarios that are relevant to their own interests. You could also take it a step further and ask it to write out an example activity using one of these instructional methods, which you could then consider adding to your instruction or modifying to fit your own preferences, of course. Next, here we have an example, which is perfect for writing discussion forum prompts. It can sometimes be really difficult uh, to get stumped on questions and not really know how you're going to get your students interested in the discussion forum and how to get them involved in an active debate together. So the next time you're stumped on questions for a forum, you could try an AI prompt such as this one and fill in your specific context. For the example of a family law course, I wrote the prompt here. Write a discussion forum prompt concerning child support in the state of Louisiana for an online family law course, along with instructions for how students can reply to at least two other students. So introducing that prompt to ChatGPT gives us a suggestion of a wonderful discussion forum where students can respond to relevant questions concerning child support in Louisiana that can help our instructor to gauge their understanding of the material. And it also gives us some instructions on how students can respond to others in a respectful and engaging manner. For our last example here, let's consider proofreading. After reading text that you'd like to provide to your students as part of your instructional materials, you can use AI to proofread and provide suggestions on how you can improve that written content. So next time you want to proofread some content, you could try a prompt such as this one. Proofread the following content, which is written for an online course. Specifically check for grammar, spelling, punctuation, and overall coherence. Additionally, provide suggestions for improving clarity, conciseness, and any areas where the content could be enhanced to better engage the students. So that's the prompt that I wrote. And I provided a uh, chunk of instructional content along with that prompt to ChatGPT. 
And this resulted in not only spell checking and grammatical review, but it also gave me this list of very specific ways that I could improve that written content that I had provided to it. So these are not just genera general generic suggestions. These are specific suggestions based on the content that I gave the AI tool. But as we know, there are more than just text-based AI tools. Now we can take a look at some ways you can use other non-text-based tools to enhance your online course. Remember Dolly, the image generation AI? It could be used to create images to accompany your instructional language. For example, let's say I'm writing a page of content about the Fibonacci sequence. Putting the phrase Fibonacci stone snail wallpaper, colorful blue gray screen, 3D pattern 8K, I know a lot of words, but they all do work together to result in a wonderful prompt that produces the following images. Uh, at this point, I could select which one I like best and incorporate it into my instructional content. Uh, for these four pictures, I personally like the second one best. So that would be the one that I would choose out of these. Next is an exciting video editing tool, which has a lot of AI capabilities. Uh, it includes the ability to upgrade the sound quality on your lecture videos. It can remove filler words such as um, uh, like, you know, all of those words. And the coolest feature, I think, of the software is the ability to use your own voice recordings to train the AI and then have it generate new recordings of your voice saying words that you type as input. In order to see demos of all of those features, you can check out the link to the Descript demo page, which Mitchell is going to share in our chat in just a moment. Uh, they put together an excellent web page with uh, videos and like audio cues. Uh, so I can't really show it in the presentation because it includes audio, but that is a really wonderful page to check out if you're interested in Descript. Uh, I highly encourage you to take a look at that. Um, so this is what the interface for Descript, the video editor, looks like. Uh, as you can see, it allows you to edit the generated transcript on the left, along with the video there in the center. And I encourage you to take a look at that link to get a better feel for how the tool works after the session. Uh, by the way, the link to that is also included here in the PowerPoint, so you don't need to worry about keeping track of it. Uh, and there are many video editing tools like Descript that require you to download a software to your computer, but there are lots of AI video editing tools out there that are web-based as well. Uh, Descript is just one program out of very many that are available to us. Lastly, here we have PseudoWrite, which is an AI writing tool. It's particularly useful for writing instructional language for content or assignment instructions. The features of this tool allow you to ask for suggestions on how to improve content that you write. And it can also help you find ways to explain dis difficult concepts to your students or provide examples for students to consider when writing assignment instructions. So in this example here, I've provided uh, a assignment instructions for an introductory chemistry course. So in this assignment, I'm asking students to choose one of their own hobbies and write an essay about how chemistry plays a role in that hobby. So this would be a really cool thing to do in module one intro chemistry course, very basic, uh, something to get students interested in the topic of chemistry and uh, help them begin to see how it's relevant to them in all different walks of life. Uh, so it's a wonderful assignment idea. But what if we wanted to provide some examples that students can relate to in order to get their thinking caps on? As you can see here, PseudoWrite on the right side of the screen there has provided some suggestions. It has one about chemistry in baking, has another about chemistry in rock climbing. So some different uh, specific examples that we can give to our students to help them select a topic. All right, so now let's switch roles for a moment and think about our students. How could they use generative AI tools like the ones we've discussed within their own context? I'm gonna go ahead and show some ideas that our team thought of. And then after we take a look at that ideas, I'd like you to consider for a moment how you and your students might be able to use these tools within your own context in your courses. So for our first example, 
what if students in a history course could actually sit down and have a conversation with historical figures, such as Albert Einstein, Rosa Parks, Cleopatra, Abraham Lincoln. With generative AI, that dream is a reality. Text-based AI tools like ChatGPT can simulate conversations with anyone, including historical figures or fictional characters. Engaging in simulated conversations like these can help students develop educational insights, gain new perspectives, and have a deeper understanding of these figures' contributions to various fields and historical contexts. Next, just like it can simulate a conversation with a historical figure, text-based generative AI can also simulate debates. This is especially useful for students to help practice their rhetorical writing and debate skills, as well as gain new perspectives on important topics. Students can practice taking different sides of an argument, they can analyze the AI's responses, and they can provide information that supports their positions or refutes their AI partner's responses. Which leads us to our next example of having students analyze and evaluate the responses generated by a generative AI tool on a given topic. That's an excellent way to practice critical thinking skills and help them examine the accuracy, coherence, and relevance of someone's claims. Depending on the complexity of the material, generative AI could also be used to answer frequently asked questions for a course, allowing students to try solving problems on their own with the assistance of AI before reaching out to the instructor for assistance or having to wait for a response. This would be a very great uh, solution to really generic, very simple, frequently asked questions for a course. Another great way to encourage effective use of AI is to let students use a generative AI tool for brainstorming and generating ideas for research projects, presentations, or any other creative assignments. This could help prevent the issue of students simply picking from a list and not really putting a lot of thought into it. Uh, and it would enable them to quickly discover topics that are personally meaningful for them and will satisfy all the requirements of a project. Lastly, we have a suggestion specifically for our computer science people. And for those courses, you could require students to write code. AI tools such as AlphaCode can allow students to provide that code that they wrote and get suggestions for how they can improve their work. So again, let's see how we would specifically phrase some of these prompts so that an AI tool could understand and produce the outcome we're looking for. First, for the example of students engaging in conversations with historical figures, let's say you're teaching a unit on medieval Europe, specifically the Hundred Years War. Here's the prompt that you could provide to your students to get them started on a conversation with Joan of Arc. We could tell them, please pretend to be Joan of Arc and tell me about your role in the Hundred Years War. So I provided this prompt that I wrote to ChatGPT. And we see that it gave us a short story from the point of view of Joan of Arc. And at this point, students could read the story, they could ask follow-up questions, and throughout the entire conversation, ChatGPT will maintain the role of Joan of Arc in all the responses until instructed otherwise. Now let's take a look at a prompt for a political science course. Let's say we want our students to have a debate arguing either for or against electing the Vice President of the United States instead of the current system we have of appointing the office. Here's how you could have students begin that debate. You could have them say, I would like to have a debate about whether the United States of America's Vice President should be elected or appointed. I would like you, meaning the generative AI, to argue in favor of electing the Vice President and I will argue in favor of the vice president being appointed. Please respond with one argument at a time. So giving that prompt to ChatGPT, we see that it plays its specific role. It has clear directions to follow, and it presents one argument at a time, which allows our students to read that argument and respond with counter arguments in a focused manner. Now let's take a look at a science prompt. So I have an example here of using AI to choose a topic for a project. Uh, similar to those instructions that I presented before of having them pick a topic from their personal lives and relate it to uh, chemistry. 
uh, I wanted to design an AI prompt for that activity. So for example, we could have students say, please suggest 10 potential topics I could choose for this essay. I like to bake, play tennis, horseback ride, play video games, and play with my cats. I hope to open my own bakery someday where I can make custom cookies and cakes for events. So the student says a little bit about themselves and asks the AI to help them choose some topics for them. So providing the assignment instructions along with that little blurb uh, gives the following result. And we see that it lists 10 wonderful suggestions for topics. Uh, it has some really cool ones, such as chemistry and the art of cake baking, uh, discussing different leavening agents, baking powder and yeast, and how they make cakes rise. Uh, it talks about the chemistry behind food preservation methods, like canning and pickling, uh, and how they prevent spoilage and extending the shelf life of food products. So some very specific examples that are tailored to the interest of the student in Wind Open a Bakery. And that's just number one, the chemistry of baking. It gave us 10 different suggestions. So lots of different, very specific uh, suggestions that it provided for us. Okay, so now that we have a good understanding of the ways we can incorporate generative AI tools in our course, as well as how our students can use them, I'd like to take a moment to ask each of you to consider how each of you might use one of the generative AI tools that we've looked at so far in this workshop in your own context. Uh, how could you as a instructor uh, use a generative AI tool in your course? And how could you instruct your students to use a generative AI tool? So I'll give you a moment to consider that. And I'd love to see some examples. If you could type them in the chat box uh, and share with everyone, we'd love to see your ideas for how you could possibly use some of these generative AI tools. I'll give you a moment to consider. Okay, so we see Lori is suggesting I would consider using it in my theory. So are you teaching a course about theory or do you care to elaborate on that? I'm curious. Let's see. And we have Brenda brainstorming team project proposal ideas in a technical writing class. Definitely. So it'd be great for team project ideas. Using to improve syllabus language and communication with students. Wonderful. And thinking about some activities for students like debate about critical issues in education or talking with a pioneer in education. Oh my gosh, that would be a really great uh, activity, Jennifer, definitely, of talking with important figures in the field of education, simulating those debates and discussions. I see generating images that correspond to the content we created during class in Spanish. Nice, or proofreading their work simulating a conversation with a political or literary Latin, Latino American figure. That's a wonderful thought. Generating questions based on a given content to verify understanding, great. Travel guides, scenario-based training, critical thinking skills for first responders. Oh, wow, that would be really useful. Oh, half of classes are theory behind computer programming. Oh, okay, awesome, wonderful list of future implications, research for the discussion session of the lab report. Great. Yeah, we can see we can use AI tools to, um, yes, create real life scenarios. Wonderful. Yes. Giving students a prompt about a specific topic in your area and they can give to ChatGPT and critiquing the AI's response. Yes, that's a wonderful idea of having students critique AI because as you'll see in just a moment, Mitchell is going to talk about how uh, AI is not perfect and <laughs> it's a great uh, opportunity to have students realize that and critique it. So great suggestion. Definitely. All right. So thank you so much to everyone for thinking of those suggestions. Really, really great ideas. 
And like I said, I'm going to be handing it over to Mitchell for the next portion of our presentation. Uh, he's going to be talking about some important considerations for AI tool usage. So Mitchell, would you like to talk about our considerations for teaching and learning? Thank you, Rosemary. With all the news stories, excitement, and hot takes that have emerged from the release of these AI tools, it can be challenging to separate the facts from the hype. We're going to take some time now to discuss considerations and limitations when using generative AI tools to facilitate teaching and learning. As you saw during our workshop so far, these tools can help provide you the opportunity to customize student learning experiences and save time in the process. Before incorporating generative AI in your course, however, we would like to present you with a list of considerations. These are not rules for using AI, but questions that are designed to help you think about the limitations of these tools and ensure that we're using them in an ethical manner. The first consideration we have is the question, does generative AI enhance or replace your instruction? Before I go into more detail on this point, I'd like, you to, I'd like to ask you a question, because a common thing that I hear is a concern that AI will replace instructors and faculty. But a question that I think of whenever I hear that is, what skills do you think that we have as humans that AI can't replace? Go ahead and type in the chat of any sort of skills that you think humans have that AI is not able to replace in what you can do, what people do in general. Carmela comes out swinging right away, critical thinking. A lot of the tools that you see are, remember a large language model is a predictive tool. So it predicts what next responses are based on the information it's given. It's not quite the same as critical thinking. Empathy is a big one. Feelings, those are definitely big. We can provide students the, all the content that we want. However, we know that, uh, that our presence in the classroom is a big, uh, is a big thing. Innovation, absolutely. Emotion, recognition of facial expressions. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm not aware at this time of any AI that can read the rim. <laughs> can connect unclear uh, statements and answers. The ability to be supportive, absolutely. Yeah, thinking ahead. Thank you so much for your participation. Instructor presence is as important a, a part of your course as any other element, whether it's your textbooks or videos. Your voice as an instructor, which includes both your literal voice and the way you write, helps you connect to your students. If you use any of these tools to create instructional content, review it and ask yourself, does it sound like a person or a textbook wrote it? And based on that, revise your content so it has your voice. Let's look at our next consideration. Is your AI-generated content accurate? We learn a great deal of information during our lives, but we can make mistakes when repeating or applying this information. Believe it or not, this also happens with generative AI. Sometimes a generative AI tool may do what is called hallucinate and present information that sounds plausible, but is actually incorrect. This can show up in a few ways. Uh, often it can show up in the form of a citation for a source that doesn't exist. As a result, you never want to take what's being generated for granted. Kind of like how if you were to look at a Wikipedia page, you don't want to take what's being written strictly at face value. You want to see what sources are being cited, do a little research to make, su make sure it's a good source. You'll want to do the similar with any AI-generated content in your course. Likewise, if you allow students to use generative AI to complete assignments in your course, you'll want to inform them about this potential pitfall. 
just because students may be younger than us doesn't mean that they're automatically better at using generative AI than us, especially since this is an emerging technology. Teaching students how to review AI-generated content for accuracy will also help them develop their digital literacy skills. Next, are you refining your inputs to get more desirable results? Think about when you search for information on the web. If you search for learning objectives, your search is going to cast a broad net over anything relating to learning objectives. You could end up having over a billion different results. However, if you tweak your search to something more specific like college algebra learning objectives, you'll get fewer but more specific results. In much the same way, using more detailed inputs or prompts will help generative AI tools provide more desirable results. For example, let's see an example where we ask ChatGPT to provide us with three objectives for a history course. As you can see, my prompt simply says, please write three objectives for a history course. The tool goes on to provide three objectives, but what do you notice about these objectives? Type, uh, type your observations in the chat area. Don't worry, you don't need to read it in too much detail to have some thoughts right away. Okay, Laurie notices that they're too broad. Karina notices that they're too long. Those are absolutely the ones that stand out to me as well. You may have noticed that ChatGPT gave us three objectives, so it technically followed the directions but they're more general in nature and they contain very long descriptions. If students encountered these objectives and descriptions in a course syllabus, they would either reread them multiple times to gain their full meaning or worst case scenario, simply skip over them and go to the next page. Our goal with our learning objectives is to make it very straightforward what it is they're going to learn in our courses. So let's take a moment, let's rewrite the prompt to sharpen the focus of these objectives. So now we have in our new screenshot, I have revised our prompt to say, write three objectives for a history course at the analyze or above level of Bloom's taxonomy. Use only one sentence for each objective. Make each sentence simple by not including any clauses. Sounds kind of odd when you see how specific I get, but you'll notice if you play with it yourself that if you don't add some of these additional uh, specific guidelines that ChatGPT and other tools can have a tendency to write much longer uh, descriptions in response to your prompt, almost like it's writing a book report at you. So by putting those uh, restrictions in my prompt, I now have three objectives that are simpler to read and have clearer intentions. The objectives overall look better, but I wanna make the third objective even more specific. I noticed because in objective three, it sounds good. It sounds like a good start. However, I noticed that ultimately the skill that they're learning is the ability to understand complex historical phenom phenomena. But I wanna ask myself, how are they going to demonstrate that they understand that? So on our next image, we're going to refine our prompt a little further. So as you can see, you can refine your prompt either directly in your initial prompt or in the case of Chat, chat GPT, I was able to type them as replies. It remembered what it originally wrote. And as you can see, I had to, I had to do it a couple times before it gave me what I wanted, and ultimately, it's now clearer how students will show how they understand historical events, because if you look at the bottom of the picture, uh, you'll see now that they are looking at historical perspectives and evidence to construct an interpretation of historical events and phenomena. So they're not just simply understanding it, they're showing it because they're writing about it. Our fourth consideration is, are you reviewing content carefully for bias? 
because of the level of human involvement in both creating generative AI tools and training them, keep in mind that these tools are not free from societal biases. Not reviewing the content generated from these tools can actually have unintended consequences, including the use of racial or socioeconomic stereotypes. Sometimes, too, it can just give you flat out, I'm going to say not great responses. There was an example I could think of kind of recently where a uh, where an eating disorder clinic had attempted to use generative AI and people who were using it were getting uh, unhelpful or dangerous responses back, such as counting calories, which was kind of goes against the best practices of advising uh, patients who would reach out to a service such as this. So it's definitely helpful to that it's definitely helpful to review created content that you use for factual accuracy and you want to review it for bias as well and doing these will ensure that your instructional materials support a diverse and inclusive learning environment. Our fifth consideration is are you being transparent with your students about AI usage? In much the same way that you would credit a human source when you present research, we recommend being transparent with your students about AI usage in your course. I think about this as a two-way street for transparency. You want to be upfront with them about what content you've incorporated into the course using AI, Similarly, it's helpful to provide students with explicit guidelines for when AI usage in the course is acceptable and when it's not. You might even consider having a set of AI usage policies in your syllabus. The important thing is, is to be specific and clear and transparent. Our sixth consideration is, are the selected tools accessible to your students? Like other technologies you might use in your course, you want to be aware of costs associated with generative AI usage and be transparent about those costs up front with your students. Ask yourself the question, are there less expensive or free tools that students can use to participate? Sounds kind of similar to a question you might ask when including curriculum materials in your course. Sometimes you can use open educational resources. This is the same principle behind that thought. You might also want to consider whether students can use the tools if they have to rely on assistive technology. For example, students might have to rely on a screen reading software in order to navigate or understand the information that's being said on the page. We recommend providing students with accessibility policies from the Toolmaker's website. If you can't find one that's available, which happens sometimes with these newer emerging technologies, one thing you can do is you can reach out to the webmaster of the website. Sometimes there's a contact us page where you can ask for that kind of information. But if not, we have kind of, we have set up sort of a basic test to check for a, a minimum level of tool accessibility. It's broken down in the three questions. Can the tool be used in a standard web browser, such as Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, or Microsoft Edge? Can you use the tab key to navigate between elements on the page, including any links, prompt text boxes, or buttons? And is the generated text selectable or searchable? Basically, what I mean by that is, can you highlight the text by clicking on the mouse and dragging it? Or can you hold Control, press F, to bring up the find menu and actually type in the words you're looking for. While these steps may not fully check a generative AI tool for accessibility, if you can answer yes to all three of those questions, students who rely on screen readers for navigation should not have too much difficulty accessing and using the tool. And those, those, uh, those steps will also be provided in the PDF as well. Our uh, seventh consideration is, have you informed your students about possible data collection? Users might have to sign up, create a login, or provide a degree of personal information to use a generative AI tool, kind of like how they may have to provide this information when registering for any other website. 
So we recommend being transparent upfront about any personal data students may need to provide in order to use these tools in your course. For example, on a lot of websites, you'll find a privacy policy. Uh, checking the website for these tools will have something similar concerning data collection. And our last consideration is, are there opportunities for students to opt out of using generative tools? This consideration ties into the previous one. Students might not wish to provide their data or are not able to pay to use a particular tool in, their, in the course. So in cases where that occurs, we recommend preparing alternative ways for these students to interact in the course if they wish to opt out of using them. For example, if a student doesn't want to use DALL-E to generate an example of an Impressionist painting, you might consider providing them with alternative instructions to search for existing examples and provide the proper credit to the creators. While we might have immediate questions about how we use generative AI tools in higher education, there are conversations occurring at a larger scale about AI usage in our society including considerations about how generative AI can be used to aid in infringing on copyright or spreading misinformation. Definitely hot topics you'll see when you browse uh, news websites. Next, we'll dig deeper into how some of those conversations are taking place and we'll share a helpful resource with you too. Many of the larger conversations about AI usage are occurring on national and even international levels. The United States federal government is also participating in those conversations. We're now going to share a link to the AI Bill of Rights with you in the chat area. This link will be shared in the follow-up email to the workshop. This document was created in October 22 by the White House. Seeing the increased popularity of AI tools that were coming up, the federal government released a blueprint for how AI technology should be developed and utilized. The vision is that AI tools should benefit people, not cause them harm. This blueprint consists of five guiding principles. Our first is safe, effective systems. The question is, um, the, the statement that goes along with it is, you should be protected from unsafe and ineffective systems. Our next principle is algorithmic discrimination protections. Basically, that means that you shouldn't be, you shouldn't face discrimination by algorithms and the system should be used and designed in a fair and equitable way. Data privacy. You should be protected from abusive data practices by built-in protections, and you should have agency control over how data about you is used. Notice an explanation. You should know that an automated system is being used and understand how and why it contributes to outcomes that it impact you. And last but not least, human alternatives, consideration, and fallback. You should be able to opt out where appropriate, and have access to a person who can quickly consider and remedy problems that you encounter. Let's, let's pause for a moment here and reflect. What similarities do you notice between the guiding principles on this slide and the, question, and the questions that we had on the consideration slide? Go ahead and type any observations that you noticed in the chat area. Lori brings up a good one, transparency. Absolutely, explaining why we're using it, how we're, how we're using it is definitely beneficial. So it's interesting to see that we're having that in the, in the larger conversation as well as in higher ed. 
see Rosemary brought up the fifth point relates to providing alternatives for students who wish to opt out of using AI. The one that uh, the one that I always think of is uh, data privacy as well, providing students with uh, privacy policies for how their data is being handled. An important thing to note is that while the AI Bill of Rights provides us with principles for developing and implementing AI tools, they're purely guidance. They're not executive orders or regulations. However, we recommend reading over these guidelines yourself at a later date and keep them in mind when you work to implement generative AI in your course. To close out our section about considerations for teaching and learning, we're going to discuss one aspect of generative AI usage that you may find especially relevant in your courses. And that is academic integrity concerns. Questions have emerged concerning how we can prevent students from using generative AI tools to cheat such as submitting a research paper entirely written using ChatGPT. Tools have started to emerge to try to solve this problem. For example, there's one called GPT-0, and Turnitin recently rolled out a new AI usage detector. Before you use any of these tools, however, there are some things that you should consider. The first being that AI detection tools are not consistently accurate and can present you with a false positive. It's possible for someone to submit a human written document and have it identified as AI generated and for AI generated content to fly under the radar of these detectors. Unfortunately, the tools so far do just do not seem to be do not seem to be fail safe. So I would definitely not I would definitely not recommend, you know, using what they say uh, for taking what they say for granted. As a result, think about those tools like you would like a plagiarism detector. A paper that's submitted to turn it in might have a high similarity score, but that doesn't automatically mean the student submitted a plagiarized paper but rather that's an automated flag that alerts you to further review the paper because it noticed an unusual pattern. That's why when it comes to generated AI usage, we recommend approaching it similarly to how you might address other issues of academic integrity. For example, you'll wanna show students that these AI tools might make mistakes. This could also be an opportunity to teach your students to pay attention to detail think critically, and not take everything written at face value. This is similar to explaining to a student how reliable, it, unreliable it can be to quote from a random blog or a research study that hasn't been peer reviewed. Additionally, just like you would clarify when students should utilize and reference outside material rather than just writing from their own experiences, we also recommend being upfront with your students concerning when AI usage is acceptable and when it's not. And finally, we believe that the best way to address academic integrity is to incorporate authentic assessments. These assessments provide students with opportunities to take concepts they've learned in your course and apply them to the real world, such as a simulation of a food safety inspection in an ag sciences course or a service learning project at a local school for an education course. Authentic assessments add relevance to the course and reduce the likelihood that students will be tempted to use generative AI tools or other outside resources to cheat. If you would like to learn more about designing, engaging learning activities and authentic assessments, you can find these topics and more in the Learn and Go section of our LSU online website. We'll post a link to the chat area now and also send it to you afterwards with additional resources. Back to you, Rosemary. Thank you so much, Mitchell.
So as we draw our workshop for today to a close, I'd like to finish with some key takeaways and very important information about resources that will be available to you. Above all else, the most important piece of information that we want you to take from the session today is that although generative AI is an excellent tool, it is not a replacement for instructors. Your expertise and guidance as faculty members still have an irreplaceable impact on your students' learning journeys, fostering creative thinking and personal growth that no AI can replicate. It would be easy to fall into a trap of relying too much on AI tools to do things like giving feedback for student assignments or making announcements to the class. However, it's crucial to remember that we need to maintain our integrity as educators and our responsibility to offer that personal touch that no AI tool can perfectly replicate. Instead, we encourage you to take all that you learned today, including both the considerations and opportunities, and practice on your own to see all the possibilities that we have with the generative AI tools available to us and how they can complement your teaching practice. A full recording of today's session will be made available on our website shortly and sent out to all participants as well as the PDF of these slides with the hyperlinks. We'll also be hosting another live session just like this in early August. Uh, that one will be available on the LSU training site if you'd like to recommend it to anyone. And in addition to this workshop, our team has also developed a handy resource that you can reference at any time, summarizing the main points of today's workshop. Lastly, you will also have access to a brand new database that we have been curating full of resources about AI. Both of those additional resources will be announced via email when they are available to everyone. And if you're watching this workshop as a recording right now, those resources may already be available to you on our LSU design and development website. Thank you again so much for attending our workshop today and being wonderful participants. We do have a few minutes left of our time, so Mitchell and I are going to stay on here and we'd love to answer any questions you have. Uh, if you want to type them in the chat or hop on the microphone. Otherwise, thank you and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. All right, so we open up the floor now if anyone wants to unmute your microphone or ask any questions in the chat as well. So one question that I see from Tia is, can you comment on the various research labs such as Mid-Journey AI. I have to admit, this is a little bit of a gap in, in my knowledge. However, uh, if Rosemary has any thoughts about it. Yes, my understanding of Mid-Journey is um, that it's one of those uh, labs similar to OpenAI and other groups that are uh, researching AI capabilities. And um, does that fit with the understanding you have, Tia? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> and let's see, in the meantime, Victor, are AI tools used to assist employers in finding qualified applicants for job openings? I personally have not heard of any job search AI tools, but like we said during the presentation, there's hundreds of AI tools created every week. And more than that, we'll see them not only as standalone tools like uh, ChatGPT and Dolly, things like that, we'll also see them as plugins for other applications. So it would not surprise me if LinkedIn or uh, one of those job search sites were to incorporate AI into their usage. Uh, but Mitchell, Karina, if anyone else on the team has heard of anything like that, feel free to comment. To uh, to comment further on that, I'm not a familiar with a particular tool for it. However, I feel like I've heard at some point that discriminative AI tools, kind of like that we've that we talked about earlier, that were more about recognizing 
certain things may have some elements in job search sites such as like Indeed or LinkedIn, but I, but I can't speak from particular experience from that. Oh, yes. Yeah, they definitely have capabilities there. It's just I don't know if there are any big companies that have picked it up and actually have anything on the market right now that they're using. Mm-hmm. To, uh, to no, take it a step. Say, oh, go ahead. Oh, oh no. I'm sorry, Mitchell. I was going to say, uh, Rosemary, to kind of mm-hmm. answer your question. Personally, no. I have not heard of anything about, you know, potential employees using this type of thing. But I do know that you can use those tools to help yourself um, as a potential employee. Uh, they do some mock interviews. So, you know, the person that's applying for the job can kind of go through that type of a situation, kind of putting in the scenario like you did for the debate. But it's more of for a job interview. But that's about the only thing that I personally have heard uh, people using it for as far as job relations go. Yeah. Oh, yes. And I can certainly add to that. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. Uh, I can certainly add that you can use some of these tools such as chat GPT to kind of give you a starting place in certain things. Like I can imagine a potential job seeker uh, creating a sample cover letter based on, uh, based on some of like their past qualifications, of course, with the caveat that they should definitely (laughs) review and revise them. So it sounds more personal than, than a machine generated, uh, letter but I, I could definitely see uh see like companies using some of these tools to kind of standardize like the production of some of like those standard documents mm-hmm. uh i see kimberly shared a resource from a workshop she went to last week uh it looks like there's a document of free ish in parentheses ai tools from a professor at utah valley so well, our uh yes our, our thank you kimberly will, for so, that yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you already got will... it downloaded for us, Perfect. Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> Beat us to it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Let's see. See, what is a good resource to track new policies on generative AI? Well, there are so many <laughs> different resources and things that are talking about policies, guidelines, and everything for generative AI. Um, As I mentioned at the end of the presentation, we'll have uh, one resource that we are developing here at LSU is a AI database. Uh, So we'll have a database of tons of different sources all about AI, different types of tools, different uses, and as well as recommendations for policy uh, and how to use generative AI in courses. And, yes, and one uh, of the documents that I am definitely going to include in that database is a live document that was put together at another university. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the name right now, but it is truly a live document. Anybody can go in and add their own policies or add their college policies to it. So stuff like that is is a good way to stay kind of up to date, but I think the best way to stay up to date is to rely on any articles or any companies, any publications that you trust. You know, the Chronicle in Higher Education or Forbes magazine or, you know, anything along those lines, stuff that you already subscribe to or, or maybe something that you might find along the way. Just constantly keep reading and updating. And that is one of the things that we are going to try our best with the database is keeping as much up-to-date and relevant information in there. Because as we have said kind of throughout this whole entire uh, presentation today is that it does change. It's constantly changing. You know, what was free today might not be free tomorrow. What Or what worked today isn't going to work tomorrow. Or something might be a little bit better. So definitely once we get the database going, look into that. And any other, like I said, any other publications that um, have good merit to you, definitely. Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of like if you're checking, if you're looking at a peer reviewed journal versus a random blog. Uh, if you're looking at a random blog, that's not to say that there are bad ideas there, but more 
like you should take a look and see what other like qualifications that they have, just like you would evaluate any other good source. Yes, definitely, especially with the emergence of AI being used to generate some of these sources. We want to make <laughs> sure that we're verifying the accuracy of everything that we see and going with sources that we trust. And I think we hit all the questions that I see in the chat. If uh, if you find afterwards that you have any follow-up questions that, that were just on the tip of your tongue and you didn't realize until after that, oh, shoot, I meant to ask about that. Uh, we did send an email yesterday uh, beforehand. with It has both my email and Rosemary's email address on it, so don't hesitate to uh, to email us. We'll be happy to help you answer those questions. Yes, thank you all so much for participating in our workshop today. And uh, we'll be in touch with the recording of the workshop, a PDF with all those hyperlinks of the tools and everything we've talked about today. And uh, thank you. And let us know if you have any more follow-up questions. <laughs> all right. Thank you all.